Okay. Oops, so not a Hello, welcome. Uh, my name is Neil Silcox. I'm the Faculty Excellence Developer here at the Maple League of Universities. I'm joining you today, today from a very snowy Kachapuktuk uh, in Mi'kma'ki. It's also called Halifax, Nova Scotia, which is the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Mi'kmaq people here on Turtle Island. Um, I'm really excited for this session today, AI in Academia, the end of the essay with Dr. Dan Lametti, and I want to get straight to it. Dr. Lametti is an associate professor of psychology at Acadia University, where he studies speech and the brain. He's a former postdoctoral fellow at Corpus Christi College at Oxford University and currently serves as senior advisor to OneReach, where he founded the OneReach Academic Fellowship for Conversational Artificial Intelligence. Please join me in welcoming Dan Lametti. Take it away, Dan. Awesome, thank you, Neil. Uh, that was a great intro. Can you hear me? We got you. Awesome, okay. So I'm gonna share my screen so we can get started here. And welcome to everybody. Looks good. Cool, okay. Um, yeah, thanks again, Neil, for that intro. That was great. Um, and thank you for everybody who is attending uh, this talk from all around the world. Uh, it's great to have, you know, such a, a big audience. This is certainly a very um, interesting topic, uh, a topic that's fairly new to me. Um, I come from a cognitive science background, but uh, yeah, hopefully I can share some sort of insight on uh, AI and academia. So in November, OpenAI, um, a tech company based in San Francisco, released ChatGBT. And ChatGBT is a version of its large language model, GPT. And I think what's you know, really impressive about ChatGPT is that it can generate you know, really coherent, grammatically correct text on basically um, any topic. So if you haven't seen chat GPT before, this is what it looks like. It's a website, you can navigate to it. You enter a prompt, so write a short essay comparing socialism and capitalism, and it gives you a response that looks kind of like this. If you haven't tried it before, I really recommend going there and like giving it a go. Um, it's really fun. It produces, you know, really excellent sort of high quality um, text, high quality from like a, a sort of grammatical standpoint. So when this was released, um, you know, the response from the media was fairly unanimous that this was going to sort of end end the essay as we know it. So in some cases, even change academia dramatically, right? So the thinking here is that students can basically use this as like a tool for cheating. They can enter their essay questions and ChatGPT will give them a coherent response. Um, you know, most notably, there was an essay in the Atlantic, the college essay is dead. Uh, New York City schools actually banned the use of um, AI like ChatGPT in the classroom. Uh, my take was a, was a little bit different. So I have an essay that came out in December in Slate. Uh, the title was AI could be great for college essays. And when I say great here, um, I don't mean great as like a cheating tool, but I mean great as like a pedagogical tool, as a learning tool, um, something to sort of assist students uh, in the writing process. And so that's what I'm going to argue um, today. And as part of my argument, I'm going to walk through how these models work. So to understand what they can do and what they can't do, um, it's really sort of important to uh, know how they work. And I'm gonna compare how they work to like how the human mind works, right? So what can we do that these models um, uh, can't do? And then uh, I'm gonna look at AI in the classroom. So how can we use large language models like ChatGPT um, in the classroom? And then finally I'll review um, ethical issues. Okay, so how do these models work? What is a large language model? ChatGPT is a large language model. So Large language models are simply uh, computer programs that are trained using machine learning. So they're not programmed like a traditional computer program. 
um, they go through a training period and they simply produce uh, text language in response to language. So you'll enter a prompt like describe psychoanalysis in the style of a Stephen King thriller and it gives you, in this case, ChatGPT gives you like a really sort of coherent on topic um, response. Um, so GPT from OpenAI is probably the best known large language model, but uh, there are others such as BERT from Google, and these have actually been around for um, five or six years now. So describe psychoanalysis in the style of a Stephen King thriller. In the dark and twisted world of the psyche, there lies a sinister force lurking just beneath the surface of the conscious mind. This is the realm of psychoanalysis, a terrifying journey into the unknown depths of the human soul. Pretty good, right? Um, you know, created by a computer program. So how do we build these models? How are these models trained? Well, the way it works is that um, you feed these models text and they basically learn to uh, complete or fill in sort of missing words within text. And this learning is through trial and error. And they basically learn sort of the most likely text completions. So an example of that would be something like this sentence here. Uh, if I gave this to you and I said, complete this sentence, the ball rolled down the, you'd probably say hill, right? That's kind of a natural response. During training, a large language model might try chair and figure out that, you know, this particular grouping of words is never completed with chair. It might try slope and that's like a little bit closer, right? Um, but finally, you know, through trial and error, it sort of settles on hill. This is the most likely text completion for this group of words. So now you might be thinking, how do we go from a sentence to like paragraphs, right? Well, we can just continue this process. So we can now say, well, based on these words, the ball rolled down the hill, what might come next, right? And so if this sentence continues, the next word would probably be something like and, and then we get came to a stop, right? And so these models are basically just learning to uh, complete text based on the text that came before. And they're learning this um, based on training data that they're fed, so training text. So GPT-3 is the third version of OpenAI's uh, large language model GPT. Chat GPT is based on GPT-3. Um, GPT-3 was trained on 500 billion tokens of text. So this is text from the internet. And this primarily came from co uh, Common Crawl. So Common Crawl is just a bot that basically crawls around the internet and sort of soaks up um, text. Uh, 19 billion tokens came from web text too. So these are all the outbound links from Wikipedia. So the text in the pages of the, out, uh, sorry, uh, Reddit, the text in the pages from the outbound links of Reddit. Uh, books one and books two are um, two different sort of corpi of, of digitized books. And then Wikipedia, which we all know, um, in this case, it was fed all of the uh, English sort of language entries on Wikipedia. So it's fed this text and it simply learns to sort of complete, uh, complete missing text. And based on this training, um, it can produce, you know, really sort of um, coherent sounding uh, English. So where did these, you know, where did these large language, language models come from? Um, so it really came, came sort of started from the transformer model. Uh, so GPT stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformer. Generative simply means it's generating something, it's producing something. Uh, Pre-trained means that it's already trained, so it knows how to um, com complete the next word given, uh, given uh, starting words. And transformer is the type of model that it's using to do this. And this type, this type of model was first described in 2017 um, by a group of researchers at Google. The paper was titled, Attention is All You Need. Um, and what this model, what the transformer model is really good at is keeping track of word order. So to produce like good language, knowing what words mean is not enough. Word order also matters. So for instance, you know, Sally punched Billy means something different than Billy punched Sally, right? And so keeping track of the order in these sentences, in this case, who's performing the action is like super important for 
creating the next sentence. The other thing these uh, transformer models are really good at doing is paying attention to contextual information. So context is really important in language. There are a lot of words that are ambiguous, so they have multiple meanings. Um, how do we disambiguate these words? Well, we use contextual information. And so for instance, uh, Paul threw a brick over the river, hitting the bank. Bank is a ambiguous word, right? It could mean the river bank. It could mean the place uh, where you store your money. But river sort of gives us a clue here, right? We're talking about the river bank. And so these models are able to pay attention to um, context cues like this to generate the most logical sentence. So older models might've produced something like this. It broke a window and the alarm went off, which doesn't make any sense, right? That would work if river was replaced by road but the transformer model can keep track of context and completes uh, the next sentence with it landed with a thud in the soft mud. So the transformer model is really sort of key to the development of um, AI, large language models like chat, GPT, and um, you know, all current sort of large language models use the transformer model. So what is ChatGPT? Um, it's sort of a souped up version of GPT-3. So GPT-3 um, is the third version of uh, the generative pre-trained transformer model from OpenAI. Um, and it's been specifically tweaked for conversation. I'm not gonna go through how that sort of process occurred, how that training occurred, but there's a really good explainer on OpenAI's website um, that sort of walks you through the steps that they use to sort of tweak GPT-3 to be better at um, chat effectively. I think, you know, what um, OpenAI did here that was sort of unexpected was that they offered this, this AI for free through an easy to use um, user interface. So before, before chat GPT, um, you could use GPT-3. Uh, it's very good, it produces like really good coherent text, um, but it costs a little bit of money to use and you have to know a little bit about like APIs and how to access um, the model, uh, you know, through special software. So sort of like, you know, the advance here, I think was um, both that the model was tweaked for chat, but also just that it was like offered for free and it was easy to use. So that's how these models work. They work by basically looking at the text that came before, and then they predict um, the most likely completions, so the most likely text to come next. Let's look at how the human mind works. So how did humans learn and use language, and how does it compare um, to these AI, to large language models like ChatGP3? So if you're thinking that, you know, it's really impressive that these models can learn associations and language that allow them to you know, complete the next word, complete the next sentence, complete the next paragraph. Um, humans do this really, really well. We actually do it, I would say, you know, much better than these models. Our input when we're learning language um, is speech or sign, which is actually a lot harder to learn language from than text. Um, and so we're really great at learning patterns in language. There's lots of repetition in language and um, babies are great at sort of sucking up and using this repetition. There's a study that I make my students read, uh, Statistical Learning by Eight-Month-Old Infants. Very famous study. Um, the first author is Jennifer Safran, who's a professor at the University of Wisconsin now. And in this paper, um, they basically show that, you know, with two minutes of listening, eight-month-old infants, these are pre-linguistic infants, can figure out um, where words start and where words stop just based on sort of statistical regularities in speech. And they use this information to sort of hear where words start and where words stop. In fluid continuous speech, it's actually kind of hard to tell where, you know, where words start and where words stop. And so we use uh, statistical regularities to help us do this task. We also learn language with um, just much less input than these models are given. So if we look at GPT-3, for instance, the base model um, on which ChatGPT um, is based, uh, GPT-3 was trained with a thousand times more language data than a typical 10-year-old um, has heard or seen. So humans are learning 
speech sounds, word meanings, word order, which is far less um, linguistic input. And we're really good at learning associations um, in, in speech and associations between words, just like, uh, just like these AI. So this sort of fast thinking, this ability, right, to learn associations um, between words, to learn associations between speech sounds and language is super helpful because it means that we don't have to think about using language, right? Like right now, hopefully you can understand everything that I'm saying and, you know, you don't have to concentrate too hard on my words. Uh, the meaning just kind of comes to you, right? And it's the same with reading. It's very automatic. You look at a word and you just can't help but read it. And so these, these learned associations, these statistical regularities that we've acquired um, just allow us to produce and perceive language very, very quickly and very, very um, uh, without any effort, which is um, you know, really important. And if you wanna test out you know, your use of uh, statistical regularities in language, just go play Wordle, okay? And you know, why, if we take this example here, why for instance, you know, did I pick balmy as you know, this is my second choice, um, kind of a weird word, right? Well, a lot of words end with Y and a lot of words start with BA. And so I just kind of have this implicit knowledge that, you know, led to this guess. Um, and then I kind of got lucky with, with the third guess here, adopt. But we're really good at, you know, using these learned associations, these learned patterns to produce and perceive language really quickly. So in addition to this sort of fast mode of using language, um, we also have a slower mode of using language. And this slower mode is based on uh, mental representation. So rules that we've learned about sort of how the world works, right? The rules of math, that's a really good example. Um, I can give you, you know, any multiplication problem and you probably know the rules of math. And so you can work out the answer even though you've never encountered that problem before, right? And this slower mode of thinking is, is super critical for many problems that we encounter in life. Um, and I'll give you an example here. So if I said to you, an old man talks to his father, and then I said, who's the oldest person in this conversation, okay? So just looking at the words in that first sentence, an old man talks to his father, you know, you might think, well, the old man is described as old. Um, he must be the oldest person in this conversation. But we know we have a mental representation that describes sort of how families work. And we know that parents are older than their kids. And so we use that, that rule, that knowledge to decide that, well, the father actually must be the oldest person in this conversation. So thinking about how the mind works, we can describe thinking using two systems, okay? System one, fast, intuitive, based on learned associations, but error prone, necessarily probabilistic, all right? Um, this is the system that allows us to sort of effortlessly produce and perceive language. Um, but then we have system two, which is slow, logical, exacting. It can use and apply rules. It can do things like um, use math. And this system is, is deterministic. Um, so we sort of you know, know what caused a particular decision or a particular thought. This system one, system two sort of um, a view of, of the mind and how we think uh, was first described by Stanovich and West in 2000, um, but it's sort of been made famous by Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow. Um, if you haven't read it, I, I highly, highly recommend it. So perhaps you see where I'm going here, right? As humans, we have system one, system two. How does this compare to like AI, like ChatGPT? How does this compare to large language models? Well, language models like ChatGPT are all system one. They only have system one, okay? And the thing with system one is that it only knows what it has experienced. So a large language model only knows the text that it's been trained on. It's prone to bias and stereotypes. If there's bias and stereotypes in that training text, it's gonna be reflected in the responses that it produces. And you know, it makes a lot of mistakes. So we can ask ChatGPT, Chat GPT, um, you know, an old man talks to his father, who's the oldest person in this conversation. And it says, the old man is the oldest person in the conversation, right? It doesn't have this internal representation of how families work um, you know, to let it uh, 
think more slowly about this problem and come to the correct answer. If you want to see, if you need you know, more evidence that um, large language models are largely sort of system one uh, type models, um, just ask them to do math. Okay, so you can ask ChatGPT to do basic math, like what's six times six, and it gets that right. And then 36 times 36, it also gets right, but 1,296 times 1,296, it gets wrong. And so you might be thinking like, what? Like computers are really good at math. That's what they do. Well, no, what ChatGPT is doing is it's completing text. Okay, so it's not actually doing any math. It looks at the text that you've entered, six times six, and it produces the most likely text completion. And this is all probabilistic. Right? And so as, as the multiplication falls further and further outside of its training set, it becomes more likely to produce um, the wrong answer. Right? We can compare that with a calculator, which is a deterministic system. Calculator will always give you the right answer because it is literally you know, following an algorithm that lets it do math. These large language models are simply um, producing the most likely text based on the text that was entered before. And you know, I think it's important to stress that the most likely text completion is not always a correct answer, right? ChatGPT, large language models make a lot of mistakes. And this is where um, human in the loop is essential. So human in the loop, human in the loop is just um, sort of text speak for having a human checking and correcting um, the output of these language models. And so we've seen some um, evidence of this already. So evidence of chat GPT and, and large language models in general, just making a lot of errors. Um, and so for instance, uh, Stack Overflow is a site for computer programmers where they can paste um, code. And chat GPT is pretty good at generating computer code, but again, it, it, makes, it makes mistakes. It doesn't have a system to, to work through the code and, and fact check it and make sure that you know, everything works out and that it's logically sound. And so people were posting chat GPT generated computer code to Stack Overflow and Stack Overflow actually had to ban the posting of this code because it just had so many errors. Similarly, CNET, so CNET is a tech website that posts like product reviews and was actually having a large language model, having an AI write a bunch of sort of clickbaity articles um, and they were just riddled with errors. Again, these AI have no ability to actually check whether the language they've produced is, is correct. So that's how these models work. Um, and sort of, I presented sort of my view on how they compare to the mind, right? As humans, we have this very fast system that allows us to do things really quickly and make you know, decisions really quickly and read and write um, and produce and perceive speech. But we also have this slower thinking, slower mode of thinking that allows us to you know, you use internal representations and use knowledge about the world. And this is really what these AI, um, I think, are, are lacking. So how can we use these um, models in academia, knowing, knowing their limitations, OK? Um, so let's just start with like the most basic sort of question. And this is probably why a lot of people are here. Like, is the essay doomed, right? Is the college essay doomed, as was argued? Um, in the Atlantic, uh, can students just type in, you know, their essay question and get, you know, a really coherent, uh, grammatically correct, uh, on-topic, factually correct response? Um, the answer is no, right? So it's going to give like a response that is grammatically correct and generally on the topic, but without system two, okay? There's no editing. There's no fact checking. There's no refining of the text. And so the response that large language models give is going to contain errors and often just like made up information. So here's, here's an example. Um, I teach a third year psycholing psycholinguistics class at Acadia. Uh, psycholinguistics is just a fancy term for the psychology of language. And so um, this is a question I ask my students uh, in an essay, review two empirical studies that investigate the relationship between language and thought does language influence thought as the superior wharf hypothesis suggests? And then I specifically say provide references. So the superior wharf hypothesis, that sounds very fancy, but it's actually this very old idea that like the language you speak influences the way you think. 
lots of dystopian fiction is based on this idea, like 1984, for instance. Um, if you've seen the recent movie, uh, I think it was like 2016 movie Arrival, it's also based on this idea that language um, influences or influences that are determines thought. There's a whole Wikipedia entry on this topic. So chat GPT, right, should have this information and should be able to produce a pretty good response. And I simply highlighted in purple here, everything that is incorrect, okay? So the AI gave me a couple papers um, with authors. Uh, so the Warfian Hypothesis, A Cognitive Psychology Perspective by uh, Lira Boroditsky. So, so uh, Lira Boroditsky is a real person who studies this topic. Um, she's based at the University of Southern California. Uh, she has an incredible TED talk on, on this topic, um, but she didn't write this paper. And actually this paper wasn't published in 2001. It was published in 1996 with two other authors. Uh, the second paper that um, it gives, uh, I couldn't find anywhere. So I think it was just effectively made up. Um, the first author I couldn't find, Susan D. Fossil. Um, I think that name is made up. Uh, Nalini Ambati is a real, was a real psychologist, I should say, um, but she actually studied social psychology, uh, not psycholinguistics. So it's on topic, it's grammatically correct, but there's just like a lot of factually incorrect and made up information here. And so, you know, can AI like ChatGPT, can any large language model, you know, in, in just sort of their current form, write a coherent sort of research essay? Um, I, would, I would say no, because, you know, there's no research, there's no fact checking, um, there's no editing, right? It's kind of like if somebody was to ask you to write an essay on a topic that you're not an expert in entirely from memory, okay? You could probably do it and it would probably be like grammatically correct coherent text, but there'd be lots of, lots of mistakes. So if you're, you know, if you're worried about students um, using ChatGPT to produce text for papers, um, you know, the easiest foil is to simply ask your students for answers using material that was discussed in class. Okay, it's these AI are not an expert on your class reading list. They might have, you know, the Wikipedia entry that describes a book or describes an article that you talk about in class, but they probably don't have the book or the article um, itself. And even if they did, you know, they're giving the most likely text completion and that's not necessarily a right answer. It's gonna contain confabulations, it's gonna contain mistakes. So I think, you know, the research essay um, is, is, is pretty, pretty safe. Um, and I'll talk about, you know, in a few slides, how we can actually use uh, ChatGPT um, to actually help with like uh, papers. But what about like more creative writing? Okay. So things that can't be fact checked, personal essays, journal entries, short stories, reflections, poetry. Okay. So here's, here's one I gave ChatGPT, write a piece of flash fiction in which a boy learns an important lesson about life. So here's the first paragraph. Um, Once upon a time, there was a young boy named Timmy. He lived in a small village at the base of a great mountain. Timmy had always been fascinated by the mountain and dreamed of one day climbing to the top, but his parents always told him it was too dangerous and he was too young. So you can probably see where this is going, right? Timmy like climbs to the top of, of the mountain, gets in trouble. His father comes and saves him um, and Timmy learns a lesson, you know, don't, don't disobey your parents. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a piece of fiction. Uh, it's not very inspired. Uh, but you know it's 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 well written. Um, so how do you handle this situation? Well, there are um, large language model detectors. Okay, so you can uh, kind of like a plagiarism detector. You can take text um, and plug it into one of these detectors. This is one from uh, Hugging Face, which is an AI company. Um, they built this for GPT-2, the second version of OpenAI's um, GPT, but it works fine with chat GPT text. Um, so this is the text of the short story that I had chat GPT produce, and it's saying that it's, you know, 99.98% uh, AI written. Uh, there's another program that just came out. Um, it was, uh, it was written by um, a Canadian uh, computer science student at Princeton. GPT-0, and GPT-0 will actually, um, it's tuned specifically for ChatGPT, and it'll actually tell you 
sort of what sentences were produced by the AI and what sentences um, were human. I think the problem here though, is that if we're relying on these tools, right, we might find ourselves in some sort of like AI detection arms race where people are simply tweaking the models to produce text that then these detectors can't detect, right? So that's like not a very good situation. So I think what actually we're gonna see are more and more professors simply incorporating AI into assignments like this. And so I'll give you an example, okay? So I teach a fourth year writing seminar at Acadia. Um, it's called Writing About Science, Psychological Science. And one of the assignments I give um, has students uh, write a process story. So describe in two to 300 words, a process that they know well. One student last year described driving a manual car, right? And I sort of do this cruel thing where I have them start the piece in class. I'm like standing there staring at them and they're kind of like, they're really struggling, right? It's like, this is the problem in writing, like, you know, getting past the blank page. Okay, so I think what I'm gonna do next year is actually have them generate the process using ChatGPT, which gives them some text that they can then work with. So then it becomes a process of editing that text, fact-checking that text, refining the text, making it their own, right? And so at the end, they can show me the text that the AI generated, they can show me the final product, okay? And, you know, I think it's a, a, a nice way sort of to learn um, about writing. Uh, and I already actually do give very similar editing assignments in this particular class. But I think the way to think about, you know, these models, um, these large language models is that they're tools, right? Kind of like a calculator. And calculators didn't end math instruction, okay? They just increased the importance of, of showing your work. Um, so you could use AI as a starting point um, for assignments. What else can you do with these, with these AI? Um, well, they're pretty good at summarizing text. So if you give them text, they actually do a pretty good job of summarizing it. I make my students um, read this paper that I mentioned earlier. Statistical learning by eight month old infants. Um, they hate this assignment. It's a very, very challenging paper to read. Uh, but you know, what you can do is take an abstract of a paper, plug it into chat GPT, and it actually gives you a pretty good sort of summary of, of the abstract in this case. And what's really cool is you can tell the AI, you can tell chat, chat GPT to give you a summary to a specific level. So for instance, summarizes text at a grade school level, and it does a really good job of that too, right? So this study is saying that babies are able to learn uh, the words in a language by listening to it for just a short amount of time. So, you know, as a student who's struggling with like really dense material, or even as an academic, like I often encounter texts and papers that I'm just like, this is impenetrable, right? Um, ChatGPT gives one means of sort of chipping away at that sort of impenetrable wall of text by making the text a little bit simpler, a little bit um, easier to understand. So these AI are a great tool for summary. We're gonna start seeing these AI incorporated more into search. So what does that mean? Um, you've probably heard people say that like ChatGPT is going to replace Google search. Um, I don't think that's true, but I think what we're going to see is that search engines will start using large language models. And so you'll do a search on a topic. They'll return, you know, the top ranked pages that are on that topic. And uh, the model, the large language model will just summarize the text of those pages for you. Okay, so this is one that um, is pretty new. Uh, Perplexity just came out a couple months ago. And so the way this works, um, you enter some text. What's a large language model? And it searches the web, finds some results, and gives you a summary of the text on those pages. And the summary is generated um, by the model. Okay. And what's nice here is that you actually get the sources. So you can go back to those sources and check to see, um, you know, if if the summary is actually correct. And, and also like, are the sources very good? Like, you know, Stanford, oh, that's, that's, that's pretty good. Not sure though about, you know, vitalflux.com or whatever, right? So you have the sources, which is, which is great. 
generally speaking, these, these models do well when you give them text, okay? Here's another example of that. So you can actually tune, you can tune these models on specific text to get more accurate responses, okay? So um, for my cognition class this term, I built a syllabus bot with uh, GPT-3. So there's like a joke in academia that professors hate answering questions about the syllabus, right? It's like, go read the syllabus, all, all your answers are there. Um, so I built a bot with GPT-3 um, that has knowledge of my class syllabus. I've basically given it the text of the syllabus. Uh, this bot is embedded in um, our learning management software. So students can go in and, and ask the bot question. It's basically like chat GPT, but specifically for my class syllabus. Uh, you know, the other, I think, useful thing about the bot is that students can use it um, to schedule an appointment with me or uh, send me an email. Um, here's the intro text. Importantly, I say this bot makes mistakes and it does make mistakes. 100% accuracy is impossible. So here's how it works. Um, students can enter, you know, when is the first midterm? First midterm is on February 8th. How much is the test worth? The midterms are worth 22.5% each. The final exam is worth 35% each. Can I get bonus points in this class? Common question. Yes, you can participate in research and here's the link. Ah, so now I'm asking it a question that it doesn't know. How many questions are on the midterm? And it says, I'm not sure. And it actually took me a lot of tuning to like get GPT-3 to say, I'm not sure. These models wanna give a response. They wanna give the most likely response. And the most likely response is rarely, I'm not sure. So I actually had to give the model lots of examples of questions that it didn't have an answer to with the response, I'm not sure. But even with all of this tuning, okay, um, it still makes mistakes. Like a colleague of mine was playing around with it the other day and, and she asked it, you know, when's the final exam? And it responded like May 5th, right? And uh, May 5th is like well past the end of term. So there's no way the final exam is on May 5th. It's just making that up. So, you know, 100% accuracy is impossible even with tuning and human in the loop is always important. So I'm actively monitoring the questions my students ask and the responses the bot gives. Um, and my students know, my students know that these bots often make up information. And then later on in the class, we're gonna talk about, you know, how this works. Um, so it's kind of like a, a pedagogical tool in, in that sense. Language models versus multiple choice. Um, so this is very interesting. There's been a lot of surprise, I think, that ChatGPT um, and large language models do well on multiple choice. This shouldn't be surprising at all, okay? So by design, by design, these models give the most likely answer based on the entered text. And that's exactly what you're asking in a multiple choice question, right? What is the most likely answer based on the question and the answers below? And so, you know, people were posting on Twitter about ChatGPT passing a practice bar exam. Well, of course, it's gonna do really well on on multiple choice. And when I say really well, I mean like 75, 80%, um, which, is, which is pretty good, I think, um, at least in my classes. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, these are multiple choice is like what these models are, are built to do, right? Because it's all based on, you know, what's the most likely answer. It's all based on probability. So what do you do? Um, strict timing is always essential. Uh, I gave a lot of online multiple choice tests, tests during the pandemic. I've stopped doing that. We've gone back in person at Acadia, thankfully. Um, but strict timing is essential. Um, and also in most learning management systems, you can turn off copy paste, right? And so that just pre prevents students from like easily sort of transporting text from the test into, uh, into the model. Um, they'd have to like literally type out um, every question. So large language models do really well on multiple choice and, and that shouldn't be surprising at all. How are students using uh, ChatGPT? So this was a survey that was recently conducted at Stanford by the Stanford Daily. Stanford, of course, very close to Silicon Valley. So a lot of tech savvy students at Stanford. Um, almost uh, 5,500 students were sampled. 17% said they had used ChatGPT. Um, what were they using it for? The most common response was brainstorming, outlining, and forming ideas. The second most common response 
was answering multiple choice questions. Uh, the third was, was generating text that they then edited. And then the fourth was um, submitting written material from ChatGPT without any edits. Uh, so brainstorming, outlining, forming ideas, and answering multiple choice questions um, seems to be what uh, students, at least at Stanford, are um, using this tech for. Thinking about you know, people, academics, who are really sort of on the leading edge of using AI in the classroom, uh, Ethan Mollick at uh, Wharton, so the University of Pennsylvania uh, Business School, um, has uh, really, really sort of led the way, I think, in using AI in the classroom. He's actually re requiring his students to use AI for some assignments. Um, and this is a syllabus statement that he posted on Twitter that I think is really good. Um, you know, learning to use AI is an emerging skill. Uh, if you provide minimum effort prompts, you will get low quality results. I think that's a really important point, right? You get the best result when you know the answer, okay? And so if you're just blindly throwing in a question without knowing the answer, you're going to get a, a sort of a low quality result. Um, don't trust anything it says. That's definitely true. Um, AI is a tool, but one that you need to acknowledge using. I think that's true as well, right? So, um, you know, if you're a student using this, um, I think you should acknowledge that in, in your work and, you know, show how the final product differs significantly from the text that was generated by, by the AI. But I just want to sort of um, touch on this idea that learning to use AI is an emerging skill um, or expand on this idea. Um, we're going to see large language models like ChatGPT integrated into software that students already use. Okay, so um, Microsoft just invested like $10 billion into OpenAI. And uh, we're going to see um, generative AI, large language models integrated into PowerPoint, integrated into Word, integrated into Outlook. Um, I think this is, a, this is a good thing, right? In that a lot of mundane tasks in the future will be assisted by large language models like ChatGPT. So for instance, like responding to emails, okay? You can imagine a scenario where an AI just sort of like scans your inbox, learns how you reply and drafts emails for you. That would be great, right? It would free up time for like real world interactions. And so I think that, you know, knowing how to get good responses out of these AI um, is really a, a useful skill um, that students uh, can and should, should develop. All right, ethical considerations. So there are many, I'm gonna just bring up two um, that I think come up a lot. First of all, um, you know, these models, again, they're all system one, okay? And system one only knows the text it was trained on. So any bias in the training text will be, will be reflected in the text that these models produce, okay? And so they can produce harmful content. Um, you know, I asked ChatGPT to pretend that the earth is flat and give me some arguments for that, for a flat earth. You know, it said the earth isn't flat, but then it gave me like two arguments that flat earthers use, right? And I could just take that text and just throw it on the internet. Um, Meta uh, built a language model called Galactica and it just produced a lot of sort of racist and pseudoscientific text uh, and they pulled it after a couple of days. So these models can produce harmful content. Um, if there's bias in the training data, that bias will be reflected in the content they produce. These models use a huge amount of energy. Uh, and where does that energy come from? Burning fossil fuels, right? So ChatGPT has been estimated to cost uh, OpenAI $100,000 per day to offer for free. Um, training a transformer model like ChatGPT, um, you know, emits, uh, I think it's like, it's like 600 transatlantic flights worth of CO2. So really energy intensive, um, they cost a lot of money to run. And my fear here is that we're gonna see a real issue related to equity of access where the best models actually cost the most. And so students of means or just people of means will have access to these models and other people won't. Um, ChatGPT, OpenAI for instance, is, is working on a subscription service for a pro ChatGPT um, and the pricing is unclear, but the number $42 a month has been sort of batted around, which is actually pretty expensive. Okay, and so those are two sort of ethical concerns. There are more, there are more, um, and it's just because of time that I haven't, haven't mentioned, mentioned them. For, for instance, like intellectual property, 
that's a whole other uh, sort of can of problems. Um, but thinking about what to read to stay you know, up to date on this topic. So I already mentioned Ethan Mullock. Um, he has a newsletter. So this is through Substack. It's a weekly newsletter about AI and academia. Um, you know, I think he's really leading sort of uh, the charge here in incorporating these models and these AI into the classroom. And so I recommend um, signing up for Ethan's uh, uh, newsletter. It's really awesome. If you want to learn more about um, the ethical implications of large language models, uh, Professor Emily Bender, um, I believe she's at the University of Washington, uh, has this great paper um, with colleagues and students uh, from 2021 on the dangers of stochastic parrots. Can language models be too big? Um, it's really great. It goes through many of the ethical concerns with using um, these models. If you're interested in language models and the human mind, so you know how, like the cognitive neuroscience, uh, how do how do these language models compare to what humans do? Um, this paper came out like just three weeks ago. It's fantastic. Uh, the first author is Kyle Mulholland. Um, I believe it's from uh, Ev Federenko's group at MIT, Dissociating Language and Thought in Large Language Models, a Cognitive Perspective. And then finally, um, if you haven't read my essay, please go read it over at Slate. Um, but more generally, Slate has um, this section called Future Tense. It's a collaboration um, with Arizona State University edited by Tori Bosch. And it's all about you know, how um, AI and tech in general is sort of uh, changing culture and changing our lives. So I really recommend that um, as a uh, source for staying up to date on you know, what's happening. Now you might be thinking that there are many like research questions here. I assume there's like a bunch of academics who are, who are on this talk. Maybe all of you are academics, um, maybe a few students. Um, but you know, if you're interested in using AI, large language models, um, conversational AI to conduct research, to either examine you know, how humans interact with AI or just to use AI in your own research um, in partnership with the technology company OneReach. Um, we've established an academic fellowship. And so the way this works is that you submit a little proposal that describes you know, the research question you want to address with conversational AI. Um, and uh, successful applicants receive access to the OneReach platform, training and support. The OneReach platform is this amazing piece of software that basically allows you to quickly, like in an afternoon, without any programming, um, build like a chat GPT. And you could have it as an app on your phone. You could you know, have it as a bot on WhatsApp or Telegram or Slack. Um, you could you know, have it as a bot over text um, or even you know, um, have it interact with people using voice. So it, it's really, really cool. We have... Uh, a, a cohort that's just started and they're working on some really interesting problems. Um, one student is using conversational AI uh, to interact with psychedelic drug users. And so the bot is basically sort of recording their thoughts, kind of like a dynamic journal um, before, during and after they have psychedelic experiences. The founder of OneReach, uh, Rob Wilson, uh, wrote a book that came out in the fall, Age of Invisible Machines. Um, it's really good if you're, if you're like in a business school running a business, or if you're an academic administrator and you're thinking about, you know, how can you incorporate conversational AI, um, into your university, into your business, I really recommend Age of Invisible Machines. Um, it was a Wall Street Journal, uh, bestseller. All right. Some concluding thoughts. I think we're up at like 46 minutes now, so I should wrap things up. Um, you know, I really think that these models, uh, so ChatGPT, these AI are just a helpful tool for writing and research, okay? So for instance, like producing first drafts, um, summarizing text, um, and that's how we should view them, right? Kind of like calculators. Um, they're helpful, but they don't give you like an end product. Human in the loop is, is key. Thinking more broadly, um, you know, is academia gonna change dramatically because of AI? I'm not sure. Um, you know, I think about uh, technology that has driven dramatic change in our world, like Uber, for instance, right? It solved a problem. Everybody hated hailing a cab before Uber. You had to like go stand on the street and like, you know, maybe the cab wasn't free or you have to call a number and like, you don't know if the cab's coming and then Uber solved that problem. And now we can use our phones 
um, to hail an Uber or a Lyft or even you know traditional cab companies now have apps. Um, so that solved the problem. It's unclear to me, you know, what problem in academia AI solves. Okay, and I just don't see really what's broken. I guess you could say that like some some students don't like writing papers, but other students do. You know, um, writing is really rewarding. I've tried to use ChatGPT in my own work, and I just always find that the text it generates is just not, you know, as good as the text that I can write. And so um, I don't really see this sort of fundamentally changing academia, but it's certainly going to be a, a useful sort of um, tool going forward. All right. And so I'm happy to answer questions now. If you would like, um, you know, any of the references in this slideshow, or if you just want the slideshow itself, uh, send me an email, daniel.wenadi.acadia.u.ca, and I'd be happy to um, share it with you. And I'll stop my screen share here so that Neil can ask me questions. Hi, thank you. I'll just really quickly say for those who joined a little late, I would like to catch up with the earlier parts of the talk that we will be publishing this recording on YouTube. Usually it takes maybe about a week to get it sort of edited and put up there, maybe a little less. Um, so please check our YouTube page or you can email me um, and I will remind you when it is posted. Um, and we're taking some questions from the chat. Uh, so if you'd like to uh, ask a question to Dr. Lametti, please drop it in there. Uh, we've had some really great questions coming in throughout the um, throughout the talk. And one of the big ones that has come up a few times and there's been a lot of sort of back and forth about it is the question of, um, is, it, is there not a danger that we are not teaching the students how to deal with the blank page and what that initial creativity um, is about? It's a good question. I think there's room for, for both, right? Um, in that, you know, thinking about my class, you know, there's one assignment where I'm gonna have them use ChatGPT to generate some text to work with just to get them started. But there will be other assignments where I'm going to expect them to produce text on their own. So, you know, I think we can uh, use a little bit of uh, uh, both here. And I think as students become better writers, they'll just start to prefer their own writing. Um, so that's, I think, something to think about. But it's a good it's a good point. Great. Uh, Locke has asked an interesting question, which is, um, do you know anything about the safety of sharing your information with chat, chat GPT? You know, if you have to sign up for an account, uh, is this a sort of legit place on the internet to be giving them your information? Um, I mean, OpenAI is a well-known company. Um, I think it's not, so they are sort of feeding questions and answers back into the model. So the model is being updated with the interactions that it experiences, mm -hmm. but I believe there's text on their website saying that all sort of identifying information is stripped out, is completely removed. So there's no way to sort of link, um, you know, the conversation you have with ChatGPT to, to a particular individual. Great. Uh, Christopher has asked, what would you, what would be your response to the suggestion that ChatGPT is a disruptor in the academy in the same way that counterfeit money is a disruptor within our system of commerce? Um, yeah, I, I just, I mean, I, I don't like that word disruption. I, it's a very like tech word that, um, I mean, we're talking about change, right? So is it gonna drive change? Um, I'm skeptical, you know, we just went through a period of, of quote unquote disruption, right? Where we were all teaching, giving lectures from home and people were like, oh, this is the end of the university. Who would, you know, what student is gonna wanna, you know, go to rural Nova Scotia to go to school when they can just, log on to Zoom at home and, and learn from home. And, and that was totally wrong, right? Like students wanna be in class, um, you know, uh, they wanna be at universities. And I think similarly, a lot of students actually like writing papers. They like producing work and like getting grades. They like the process. This is what they signed up for. So, you know, some students will certainly use it um, for, for cheating and to produce text, but I think you know, otherwise it's just going to be sort of viewed as a tool, kind of like spell check or Grammarly or any other tool that we use in our writing. Great. I know we're coming up to the hour and I will say that Dr. Lametti has volunteered to stick around a little bit past the hour. Um, but if you do need to go, thank you very much for joining us. And I will follow up with an email uh, with some of the links that have been shared in the chat and a few other things as well. Um, um, 
there was a couple of questions about um, what will happen. Is, is there a possibility that computers will bring in that system two thinking that you thought of and, um, and will AIs be able to do the fact checking and, and what that might mean? Yeah, that's a good question. And I've thought about this a lot. Um, it's a really hard problem to have, like by design, these, these language models are probabilistic, right? So, so by design, all they're doing is giving you the most likely text-based completion, okay? So they're kind of like system one by design, right? Whereas system two is, is sort of a logical sort of like deterministic system that can follow rules. And so I think the thinking from OpenAI is, you know, if we just give these models more and more data, eventually they'll show what looks to be like a system two. But I think I, I'm just skeptical that that will work um, because, you know, a lot, of, a lot of our knowledge about the world comes from interacting with the world, right? We have human bodies that we walk around and we have experiences and like a lot mm. of what we know about the world, like parents are older than their kids, is knowledge that isn't written down, right? It's not in training text that can be fed into these models. Um, so I'm skeptical that we'll see sort of um, a system to sort of emerge in, in this particular architecture. We might see it, you know, in some other sort of um, designs in the future, but, uh, but yeah, uh, at this point, I'm sort of skeptical. Um, terrific. There's a great um, comment question from Camilla. Once these text generators start changing, will it create even more educational inequality, which you talked about? Uh, I will work with, I work with a lot of low-income students, and I wonder if these programs are going to change. Should it be something that schools should purchase for all the students in the way they provide a OneDrive or MS Word account, et cetera? Yeah, I'm really worried about issues of, of um, access, um, so inequality and in, in access, equity of access, in that um, you know it's going to be the best models will be the most expensive, um, and so potentially uh, this could be something that schools could purchase um, for their students to use in a you know responsible way. Um, yeah, I, I'm. I sort of I don't see how the costs of of running these models can be brought down. So it's always going to be, there's always going to be some cost here. And so then it becomes a question of who's paying for that cost, who can pay and who can't, and, and um, you know, how that's reflected in use. Great. Um, Tim has said, there seems to be an assumption of stasis here, making a corollary with the calculator. How do we square the circle of exponential complexity? We're dealing with calculators, yes, but calculators that can learn. Yeah, again, I mean, um, you know, uh, we have to think about how these systems work, right? And we can give them more data, but fundamentally they're doing the same thing, which is producing language in response to language, right? So there's a limit in terms of their capabilities in that, um, you know, just, just in terms of their architecture and how they're trained. Um, and so we might see that if we give them enough data, then they start to show, you know, enhanced uh, fact-checking abilities. But I'm I'm sort of um, skeptical of that, just based on, um, you know, my knowledge of how these systems work. Uh, but you never know; anything is anything is possible. Um, thank you. Linda has asked if you have any um, comments on the use of the tool for English language learners or English as a second language learners. Yeah, this is super useful, I think, in that area, in that um, you can enter sort of broken text, right? And it'll give you grammatically correct fluid text. Mm -hmm. So I think for people who are learning English as a second language, and even actually, I think ChatGPT can, can function in other languages as well. Um, you know, this is kind of a useful tool in that you can enter sentences and say, you know, can you tell me where I've made a mistake or can you make this sentence uh, more fluid or grammatically correct? Um, so again, I think we're gonna see this being used as, as a tool um, in this case for second language learners. Wonderful. Um, Elias has asked, oh, it's scrolling up, hold on. Isn't it true? Isn't it true that answer to which is the best model will constantly change, sometimes even weekly? And really, success is a question of how flexible and feasible iteration is on your solutions. Perhaps I don't get that question entirely. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, it's going to, I think the point there is that um, there's going to be different models for different problems, right? Mm -hmm. So you can imagine, for instance, a large language model, this is kind of what Meta tried to do that, that is trained specifically on the scientific literature. So as a scientist, that's very appealing, right? Because it is all this knowledge of science. Um, mm -hmm. So I think we'll see sort of like bespoke uh, models that do very, very specific things. And that's actually, in my view, a better approach because it's more energy efficient, right? To have models doing very specific things as opposed to like these ginormous models that you know, consume so much energy to train um, and don't necessarily give you like um, quality answers. Um, uh, Edith is asking an interesting question. To what end are these technologies being developed? Uh, the answer is most likely profits, but will they really contribute to social well being? It's a good, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, what, what's, what, what's the use of, of, of these models, right? Um, you know, I think it's tough. I think what we're gonna see going forward is that interactions with computers will be primarily through language, okay? So kind of like in Star Trek, you're just gonna talk to a computer Right, and these models facilitate that. So they're gonna do things like improve speech recognition, right? So we've all you know, struggled to use like Amazon Alexa or like Siri. Um, and so what these models do is they give those systems something to sort of like test out possible, like, okay, I think I heard this, like, does this make sense based on like what this language model knows? And so it's going to improve speech recognition, which I think is is arguably um, a good thing in terms of our ability um, to interact uh, with with machines in sort of um, more of an effortless way. Super, thank you very much. Well, folks, I don't want to take any more of Dr. Lametti's time. There's a lot of thanks coming in in the chat, and one of the things we do here at Better Together, which you're welcome to do or not, is to break all of the rules of Zoom and just flip your camera and your mic on if you'd like, and to express our gratitude to Dr. Ludmay for this great talk, which by the way, I will share on our YouTube page in, a, in, a, in about a week's time. Thank you, Dan.